Hi everyone, I want to welcome you on to Blessings with Brendan tonight. I had a week off and I'm feeling rejuvenated and I've got a message that I really think is going to speak to you. It spoke to me, uh, you know, God uses me to give these words to you and I just felt the spirit moving through me while I was writing these this message for you and while I was uh, developing this message for you. So I think you're going to love it. Um, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the channel so you can see when new content gets released. And please feel free to share the message. We want to reach as many people as we can with this ministry. And as we go into this new Easter season, I want us to really assess our souls and our spirits and find out how God is using us and moving through us in our lives. And I think that's a proper segue into tonight's message. And I'd like to think about perspective. And I'd like to talk about perspective tonight. And to do that, we are going to talk about Romans chapter 8, verses 23 through 25, and I'll reference 18. And we will also be referencing Psalm 27, verse 13. And those will all be in the description of this video, so don't feel like you have to write them down at the moment. At times, I think that it seems we have been hardwired to look at difficult situations pessimistically. And for good reason, you know, with shootings, riots, illness, and war occupying our screens, you know, our phones, our television sets, the radio, and the tension that is filling the air. You know, the way we interact with people that are around us, our relationships with others, I feel have never been more strained than they are at this point. With a global pandemic, with growing racial tensions, with growing uh, income inequality, these are all things that are contributing towards a chasm in the way that we respect and we treat other people that are around us. And likewise, our interpretations of life events, I feel, have never been more threatened by negative mentalities, pessimistic mentalities, looking at the glass half empty, even. And it's not only about the chasm between ourselves and others, or the chasms that we set between ourselves and, you know, our expectations of ourselves. But what happens in the world begins to open a fault line in our relationship with God as well. So that chasm that extended between us and others now is extending between ourselves and God. And that is perpetuated through difficult moments in our lives, difficult life events. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that God will use difficult moments in our spiritual journey to move us forward in the progression towards eternal salvation. So I want to call this message Glass Half Full Faith. We're going to take a look at the words of Paul in Romans 8, and what he calls us to do in times of trial or times of struggle. Because I really, truly believe that hardship is not our definition. Hardship is our testimony, okay? We're not defined by the hardship we go through. We're defined by the way we come out of that situation. We're de defined by the way that we react to our hardship. We're defined by the Spirit within us. So please turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 23 through 25. And we'll start now. Not only so, this is Paul speaking to the Romans, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly, as we wait 
eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Verse 24, for in this hope we were saved. In the hope of our adoption to sonship, in the hope of the redemption of our bodies. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. This is a lot of information that is packed into a very small subsection of Romans, so I want to go through verses 23 and 24 particularly very carefully. Verse 23 says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. So that's the first point I want to focus on is what is a first fruit? What is Paul referring to when he says that we have the first fruits of the Spirit within us? And what I'm drawn to in my mind is agriculture. It's the first thing that you harvest at the beginning of an agricultural season. The first fruits are, are collected at the beginning of the harvest. So it's reasonable to assume that those who are receiving the first fruits of the Spirit will receive more in coming seasons. Those who are harvesting the first fruits will have more to come. So in the context of the way that we perceive certain situations in our life, I think that we can take something away from this passage itself because we recognize that the thing that we are going through at this moment is temporary, okay? The thing that we are going through at this moment is just a step in the process of sanctification in our lives. I think about, you know, all of the pain and all of the anguish that is going on in our world at the moment. Uh, even today, right before I got on, I found out that there was a shooting at a high school in Tennessee. And just thinking about the other utter and profound pain that not only the children at that school feel, but that the parents of those children are feeling. I can't fathom that. Why would God allow something like that to happen? I think that that question is difficult to answer from a human perspective. Because we're hardwired, we're inclined to think negatively. But when the Spirit dwells within us, we recognize that hardship, while not justified, it's never justified to kill another human being, of course. I think that hardship is a pathway towards revelation in the Spirit of God. I pray that we as a human society will learn from the hardship that occurred today. I pray that we as a community will learn from the hardship that was perpetuated in the killing of the gentleman in uh, Minnesota just yesterday, I believe. I hope that we will grow from the death of George Floyd, from the death of Ahmaud Arbery, from the, the constant state of war that our country is in, and our world is in, these are present things. And now I want to focus on verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. This hope. It's, it's, it's something that we anticipate. But that cannot be tangibly seen or felt at this moment. If we were knowledgeable of everything that was to come ahead of us, 
of every promise that God was going to fill in our lives, then we would never be subjected to hardship ever. And the reality is, is that is not the case. Bad things do happen to good people, and good things happen to people we consider to be bad people. Difficult times are a part of our earthly life for those who live in the Spirit and those who don't. Difficult times are a part of life for those who live in the Spirit and those who don't. Our reaction, our reaction to that situation, I feel is what diversifies us who are in the Spirit and those who are not. Because sometimes difficulty does present physical or emotional discomfort. And it's easy to make emotional or physical comfort our God. But that's probably a, a topic for another Blessings with Brendan. It's, it's easy to make being in a comfortable state something to be achieved. But all of this, as Paul says, is in the name of our adoption into sonship or our fulfillment as children of God and the, quote, redemption of our bodies we are hoping for something that is not seen. How do we hope in something that is not seen? What is the redemption of our bodies? I wasn't really sure how to answer this. So I looked to Google, of course, and I found a theologian by the name of John Piper who makes this really good point about the redemption of our bodies. And he points to 1 Corinthians 6, 13b, which says this, The body is not meant for immorality, but for the Lord. The bot. let me say it again. The body is not meant for immorality, but for the Lord. That means that whatever the reason is that we have been given bodies, it is for the Lord. The reason why we do not come to the earth as spirit alone is because we are here for some divine purpose. And the point that John Piper makes is that our bodies were created, they were formulated, and they have now been brought back from sin. They've been bought back even by Jesus' death on the cross, another violent act from sin in order to be a unique, okay? We are unique, every single one of us, because we are a habitation, a dwelling place of the Spirit. And that is done in order to display the glory of God. The people who perpetuate these acts on earth sometimes do it in the name of God. But I, I, I implore you to see that their intentions are not glorified. Their intentions are not divine. Because we have been redeemed from sin. When we formally allow the Spirit to dwell within us, we begin to no longer think with political inclination. We no longer begin to think with violent intention. Though sometimes we do, acting upon it is a different thing. But even the thought of it is not from God. Because through death in Christ, we can't think like the world does. We don't think like the world does. Whatever is not coming from God, that is from the enemy. Because we have been hand-picked and selected to perpetuate the glory of God on earth. These difficult situations arise. They always do. But what is trying to be said is that the redemption of our bodies refers to the utilization of our vessel by the Spirit 
the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, to paint a picture of God's image in the land of the living. Though difficult times may happen, the faith community will be the ones who create and initiate healing. The faith community are the ones who will initiate love, respect, honor, decency towards our fellow human beings. And I want to bring up Psalm 27, which says this, I remain confident, say it with me, I remain confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. By demonstrating confidence in the sight of that which would intimidate your physical body otherwise, that which would inclinate your body towards judgment, that, that which would inclinate your body towards violence otherwise, you are in fact condemning the enemy with optimism. By going against the wind, by going against the normal reaction that you would have to a situation, you are in fact living in the promise of God. You are condemning what the enemy wants to perpetuate on earth by giving a 180 perspective of it. Your perspective can influence the perspective of someone else. That's why Paul says in verse 18 of Romans 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I'd like to close with this summary. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. It says that in the Bible. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. We are sanctified pilgrims walking in the midst of inconvenience, of hardship, of pain, and of blatant devastation. And I just want you to realize that whatever you're going through right now, whatever the world is going through, whatever is testing your faith or your heart today, will be the foundation of your testimony to someone else going through the same situation tomorrow. Your testimony will bring someone back from the brink of suicide, from the brink of giving up their hope, the blessed hope. Push through. Remain confident that you will see the goodness of the Lord. And rely on the demonstration and the care of your community to help you persevere. My mom always says, this too shall pass. And when I think about all of the pain we have been through in the past year and a half, and all the pain that continues to go on in our country, around the world, in impoverished communities, I have to think that this will pass, but it will take some sort of instigation, some sort of annoyance by faith. We want to be annoyed by the Holy Spirit. We want to be driven to initiate by the Holy Spirit. Just like a point guard on the basketball court is the initiator on offense, we have to be the initiator of common good and decency for all people, those who believe and those who do not believe while we have our earthly vessel. In that light, I challenge you to look at the glass half full. Because faith with hopeful optimism will be your light, your beacon, and your guidance through the darkness. And guess what? You can guide someone else with that light too. So, Father, tonight we pray for the people we have lost to senseless violence. We pray for the people who have been lost 
to common indecency for our fellow human brothers and sisters. We pray for those who have been lost due to the color of their skin, due to the creed which they choose to live their lives by, due to their, their ethnicity, due to the way that they identify. Take them into your loving arms, Lord. And in Jesus' name I pray that we will begin to look at every situation in our lives with the glass half full. Because we are confident that you will get us through. You have been faithful to us before. And the sum of our lives is a testimony to that. So Lord, in times of hardship, we ask that we are reminded of the constant intercession you have had that has brought us to this moment. And for all of you who are feeling discouraged on this call today, I pray that you will find peace. I pray that you will find love. And I pray that you will find affection, the affection of the Holy Spirit. Now, in this moment, I pray that any evil demon, any evil mentality, any evil thought will leave your head. And I command that in the name of Jesus. And I pray that we will all be sanctified and that we will all one day pass into the arms of the one who made us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God be with you. God be with your family and your children. Please reach out to me. Let me know how this message affected you. Let me know how I can pray for you. And let me know if you'd like to hear anything from me. Until next week, God bless, and I will see you soon.